my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer, and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. This episode is sponsored by BabyList. BabyList's mission is to make baby registries more personal and less overwhelming. You can put anything on your baby registry from any store. Aside from being able to pull in items from various stores, you can also add cool things like mommy and me workout classes, photography sessions, doula support, and helpful postpartum stuff like home cooked meals and even dog walking. Babylist is currently partnering up with some amazing brands to bring you the best baby registry giveaway, which is a $5,000 prize bundle that includes a year's supply of diapers, a dream nursery, baby clothes, and essential baby gear. You can find the link to the giveaway on today's show notes page. And at the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Sarah about her experience using BabyList as a first-time mom. Today's guest is Alexis, who is a survivor of sexual assault and is sharing how she believes her history affected her births. Alexis hopes to use her experience to hold space with other survivors and let them know that their birth can actually set them free. Hi, Alexis. Thanks for coming on the birth hour today to share your birth story. Hi, thanks for having me. Can you start off by telling listeners just a little bit about you and your family? Sure. I have two kids. I actually have an entire redheaded family. My husband is a redhead. I'm a redhead. Our kids have red hair, so I call us the Fuegos. Uh, My son is four and my daughter is two. And my husband and I have been married for almost seven years now. (laughs) So I'm a social worker And I worked full time for my son's first year of life as a domestic violence uh, and sexual assault counselor. And then after we got pregnant with my daughter, I decided uh, it made sense financially. uh, Two kids in daycare is massive. So it made sense for me to stay home and leave my job. But I always had a passion for that work um, and for advocating for sexual assault awareness. I'm a survivor myself. Um, so I, I intend to maybe just focus on my son's birth, but I might touch a little bit about my daughter's birth. They're actually very similar. And I think that the reason that they're similar is because they're linked to my history as a survivor. So I was kind of hoping to touch on that as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much for um, being, you know, so open with us. And I know that there's probably a lot of people out there that will, unfortunately, as we know, based on statistics, um, resonate with some of the things that you're going to share. So I really appreciate you, you know, reaching out to me and being open to sharing your story. Yeah, of course. I feel it's healing for me to to be able to use my voice um, because hopefully someone who needs to hear this can. Mm-hmm. Well, let's start with finding out you were pregnant with your son then and just kind of what that experience was like and how your pregnancy was. So uh, he was one of those, we're not trying to prevent pregnancy. <laughs> we were probably like saying like, oh, it'll be fun to have a baby. And then, you know, three or four months later, we found out we were pregnant. So we were really excited. We had just bought a new house. And at the time, I didn't really know much about birth or my choices or my options. I was just one of those that went to the doctor and did what the doctor said. My gynecologist was also an OB at the time. So I just stayed with her because she was the lady I had been seeing before being pregnant. And it wasn't until I was like 22, 23 weeks. And I watched, of course, the business of being born the film that seems to change so many people's minds about birth. We had watched it actually at my husband's. He had heard about it and he he was the one that wanted to watch it. And I was like, okay. And so we watched it and we both were just kind of like, honestly, we were kind of like in shock. Like we don't know a lot of things we need to educate ourselves. So we decided to hire a doula 
um, and she encouraged us to take a childbirth education class. We did birth boot camp, which is like a 10 week uh, natural childbirth class and completely shifted my perspective of birth and just being informed and making choices and being a conscious consumer. Like just the fact that I never questioned my doctor, I just so did it make you want to re-examine who you had chosen to be your doctor or did you feel like with the class you were prepared? No. So that's what I was trying to say. Thank okay. you. <laughs> so at 30 weeks, we, after taking the class, like we started asking our provider more questions and didn't get the responses we wanted to hear. So at 30 weeks, we changed providers. So we still changed to another OB. Uh, I think I was still unsure about delivering outside of a hospital. So I still want to deliver in the hospital. Um, but I found an OB who was a lot more supportive of, you know, some of the things that I was wanting for my birth. Um, so anyways, that was, that was kind of my initial journey into the, the birth world. And I was pretty ignorant before that, even just about my own body and what it's able to do. Well, both of my births, I had like long, intense, like prodromal labor type experiences. So for him, it was a three-day ordeal. <laughs> my labor started on a Saturday night. Uh, we actually had started doing all the induction tricks. And that night, I had eaten sp spicy food. So I don't know if it was the spicy food or all the other things or just because my baby was ready to be born, but that was the night that contractions started for me. And they were definitely exactly, you know, like they said they would be in class. They started out very slow and they were, they weren't quite as intense. So when we called our doula, she told us, you need to go to bed, like go to bed and sleep. So that's what we did. And then by the next morning, on Sunday morning, they had started to pick up and they were starting to make more of a regular pattern. I also had terrible, terrible back labor. Each contraction would kind of radiate around to my back and it wasn't something, I didn't expect that. I felt pretty prepared like with our classes and the books that I read and everything, but when the back labor started, I was like, what is this and why is it happening? So our doula ended up coming to our house. We labored there pretty much like most of the day Sunday. And um, I eventually moved into an active labor pattern. My contractions were every two to three minutes apart. And the doula suggested, you know, maybe it's time for us to go to the hospital. So at this point, it was, it was like 8 or 9 p.m. on uh, Sunday night almost a full 24 hours from when my first contraction had started. And when we got there, of course, they wanted to check to see if I was dilated and I was a big fat zero. So of course, that was pretty discouraging, but I was really, really determined. So we stayed at the hospital. They suggested that we stay for a few hours and then they would check me again to see if I had made any progress. They did let me do like intermittent monitoring they were really flexible with kind of some of the things that I wanted to do because I wanted to be able to move around and try different positions and stuff. So we stayed there for like another three or four hours and I got really aggressive and like was moving around and trying different laboring positions, just anything to try to get things moving and get things progressing. And it was, I think around like 1 a.m. was when they did the second cervical check and I had zero change. So, uh, that was devastating because <laughs> I've been doing all this work all this time. Um, and really since like, probably since like midday Sunday, I had been in a pretty consistent active labor pattern. So I wasn't really having a lot of a break and I was really tired, really laboring hard for that long. And so at that point, they said, you can stay in the hospital, we can start Pitocin, or you can go home and keep laboring at home, or we can give you an Ambien and you can try to sleep and then see if things pick back up. So I chose, I chose the drugs and uh, we went home and they did not help me sleep. The contractions did slow down. They moved into a really funky pattern but I did not sleep. So I was still very, very exhausted. 
So the next morning around 9 a.m., um, my doula suggested way more aggressive things. She did a really funky position called side lying position, which <laughs> like basically you're like falling off the side of a couch and it was crazy pants. But uh, I did it because I was just determined to do anything to see if it would help position the baby differently so that my cervix could start opening up. We even went to the, during that time, we even went to the chiropractor. So this was on, now what day, were, this was on Monday now. And we went to the chiropractor, I got adjusted. And immediately after I got adjusted at the chiropractor, I felt what I thought was my water breaking. It turns out it was just my mucus plug. But I started to get excited at that point because that happened, my mucus plug happened and then the contractions went back into this really active pattern. I was having them every two to three minutes. They were lasting a minute or longer. They were really intense. I was having to like really concentrate through them. And it kind of felt like back to that first stage of active labor that I was in. And so I was like, okay, things are working, things are going, you know, it's working now. So we kind of stayed in that pattern for a while and let myself labor some more. And then from there, it really got intense. I started feeling a ton of pressure. I threw up a few times um, with contractions. I think my doula must have thought I was in transition stage. And so she again suggested we head back to the hospital. So that was, that was at like 4 or 5 p.m. on Monday. So we got back to the hospital. And of course, the hospital has to check your cervix. I was really anxious about it and I didn't want them to check my cervix because I was really scared what they were going to find out. And they found out that I was only two centimeters dilated, but we were well past 48 hours of me with no sleep, really laboring through some tough, painful contractions, especially the back labor contractions that I had. I just really wasn't a human anymore. I, <laughs> I, I lost it and was crying and I essentially was just like, I'm done. Give me the epidural. My body's broken. We actually had this plan. My husband and I had this plan ahead of time that if I asked for the epidural, he was going to fool, fool me with trickery uh, <laughs> and tell me that, uh, like, tell me that he was going to get the nurse, but then come back and say, oh, she's on her way, even though he didn't actually say anything to her. So, that didn't work because at that point I was like, do not fool me. I know what you're doing. Go tell them I need drugs right now. So um, they placed the epidural. It was like 9 or 10 p.m. On, on Monday night. And pretty much I passed out. I went right to sleep. I was dead. I slept really hard. And then at 2 a.m. I woke up because I was feeling some weird stuff and it ended up my water had broken at 2 a.m. and they did a cervical check then and I was eight centimeters. So, um, cause they also, I guess I should have said that when they gave me the epidural, they also started me on Pitocin. And so obviously that and just rest, uh, really kick things into gear. So by 3 a.m. now Tuesday, I was eight centimeters dilated and then things really moved a lot a lot more quickly from there. Uh, I think they checked me again at f five and I was nine centimeters and then it was time to push at 7 a.m. on Tuesday. Pushing was also really crazy and intense. Uh, I pushed for an hour and a half and my husband, <laughs> he, if you look at uh, some of our birth, birth photos, like you can tell that he's a little terrified. He said that basically my son's head would like come out and then like suck back in and come out and suck back in. So um, that was happening for a while. And then thankfully, finally, he decided to go ahead and come on all the way out. So he was born uh, at 8.33 on a Tuesday morning after that long, terrible ordeal. So mm. <laughs> at the time, I didn't know this, but as I said, I I'm a survivor of sexual assault. And I recently became trained as a doula and during my doula training, I had to read the book called When Survivors Give Birth. That book was like life changing for me and really made me realize how much my history impacted that experience. 
you know, at the end of my son's birth, I was really discouraged because I had, I had done all this planning. I had taken a 10 week course. I had read all these books. I, you know, I cared about my diet. I exercised, I was taking care of my body and, you know, doing my best to prepare it to be able to do what it was built to do and to give birth on its own without any type of intervention. And so I felt, I felt like a failure and I just felt like my body was broken, but I never really linked my history with why that might have been going on until I read this book. It's more geared towards birth professionals or care providers. It's pretty clinical and it's more about like them being informed about working with anyone who's experienced trauma um, and how they can better support them. But I realized after reading it that I was very much triggered in my birth with my son. The cervical checks, those were the worst possible thing that I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, I actually, like the first cervical check that they did the first time we were in the hospital, I was like suiting on to the wall. Like I was like leaving the bed, leaping out of it onto the wall. I was terrified. It was painful. I didn't want it to happen. It felt like I was being violated all over again, but I never, and, and it blows my mind because I've done this work. Like I've worked with survivors as a counselor. I've counseled them. I know about trauma reactions and I know what it looks like. And I know how to help someone be able to manage those reactions when their triggers come up. But I just completely, it was like my brain just like shut it off from birth. Had you shared with your care providers about your history at all? Yes, I did. And that was the other thing. I didn't share in like saying like, hey, guess what? I'm a sexual assault survivor. Um, I just remember each, like my OB had in an intake form, there was one of those like check yes or no boxes for are you a survivor? Um, And I checked yes. And then the same thing with my doula. Um, She also had that question on her intake form and I checked yes. But there was never like a follow-up conversation. So it really got me to thinking about how obviously if those questions were on their intake forms, then they know that it's an important question to ask, but they didn't have like the training to know how to handle it if someone did check yes or how to better support that person in their birth. So I was also angry almost uh, after the fact, like as I was reading the book, like I was just feeling all these emotions and I was like, you know, I checked yes and there was, we didn't do anything. We didn't make a plan for this. We didn't talk about it. And, and, it, and I feel like if I, if I had, if I had talked about it with them and I had like really kind of thought about the things that might trigger me throughout my birth that, you know, everyone could have been a little more sensitive along the way and supported me in a different way where I wouldn't have been so resistant because I definitely think that that contributed to my failure to progress. Just not feeling safe and comfortable is it yeah, has a exactly. huge impact on birth. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I, of course, fear is also a huge part of it. And mm-hmm. I honestly think that my body, you know, like mentally, I thought I was good. You know, I was ready. I could do anything. But it was almost like, you know, when trauma happens, your body carries that you know, you might go to counseling and you might do all this work to heal from your trauma, but it, it doesn't necessarily leave you. It's almost like it's, it's dormant. And then it's just waiting for a trigger to kind of wake it back up. And so I feel like my body remembered what happened and it was almost like shutting down on its own to protect me in a way. I didn't feel safe and it was just preventing me from being able to really be vulnerable and um, release my fear and let my body open. It just, my body just completely shut down. So, and that's what, and, and this pretty much the exact same thing happened with my daughter. So I, uh, even after my son's birth, like multiple people told me, you know, every birth is different. Um, you'll have a totally different experience. Um, and then, I experienced my daughter's birth and I was like, you're all liars and I hate you. Um, but again, I still didn't know at the time I didn't, I, I've read this book three months ago. So (laughs) my daughter's too. 
So my births happen well before I realized the connection. Um, but my daughter's birth literally unfolded pretty much exactly the same. The only difference with my daughter was my water broke to start my labor. And it was just like in the movies, a huge gush all over my bathroom floor. Um, and so, and, and that time around, the other difference, I guess that was also a difference. The other difference is I had planned on a birth center birth. So um, I... After my son's birth, I felt like I was like, it's the hospital. Like that environment just, I, I didn't feel comfortable there. I couldn't relax completely. So I wanted a new and different environment. And then I also wanted a care provider that was more involved. And I knew that midwives provided more one-on-one -on -one care um, and they were with you a lot longer and uh, all that stuff. So we chose uh, a birth center for my daughter. And I felt like even then... It, it was more like a, a hospital for me, actually, the way it played out is because since my water broke, they were still concerned about infection. So they put me on a time clock. Just being on that time clock really threw things off because it just wasn't what I expected. So it kind of threw off that whole environment anyways, because it happened that way. Um, but other than that, it was the same thing. Like we went to the birth center, like I got into an active labor pattern after my water broke. We went to the birth center, they checked me and I was dilated zero <laughs> and they sent us back home. We went back home, did all this stuff to get labor going again, got back into a crazy active pattern. Um, I, I had back lab the same back labor again all my contractions once I got into the active pattern were like super intense and painful and then went back to the birth center the second time. So I had, I labored a lot in cars both times and that's the worst place to labor ever. So anyways, this, the second time we went back to the birth center again, they checked me no change. Um, and so literally it just kind of like mirrored my son's birth and I think that, again, can, you know, not only was the fact, everything that I said about being a survivor playing into it, but the fact that I was kind of like replaying the exact same birth mm -hmm. all over again, um, it just, it, my body just was like, no, we're not doing it. It was the same thing. I didn't progress. And then we, we ended up getting transferred to the hospital. They let me go the full 24 hours. I labored there the full 24 hours, but then because of risk of infection, they wanted me to go to the hospital. So, um, and same thing, I got Pitocin, I got an epidural when I got to the hospital and pretty much both of those things made things go really, really quickly. Then she decided to be born. So the reason that I wanted to speak to this is because I wish I had known this before my birth. And I think in general, birth is this like completely transformative intense experience. So whether you're a survivor or not, it's almost like this opportunity for you to like feel really powerful and you transform into this completely different woman. You become a mother and it's this really positive, powerful, beautiful thing. But adding on the fact that I was a survivor, like I'm already, many survivors already deal with this loss of control. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, that that was taken from you. And it's almost like I feel like I'm constantly fighting to get my power back. And so I just feel like if I had been more prepared for how my history was going to affect my birth, and I could have planned for that better, that it really honestly could have been this amazing healing experience for me as a survivor as well. And so I just want every woman to know that and to know that the things that you carry with you, they can have an impact on this transformative stage in your life. And we need to think about that and we need to prepare for how we can feel supported so that we can still have the birth that we want. That was really, really beautiful. Um, was there anything from the book that you read that you could share that would have been things that you think would have helped you or that might help other women? For me personally, 
what I took from the book is simply that a lot of the procedures that are common in pregnancy and labor and birth, they're very invasive, obviously. Uh, you know, you, you don't really have any, there's no modesty or privacy or anything like that. So those can easily be triggers for a survivor. And so for me personally, it was definitely, I was definitely triggered by the cervical checks. I was also even, even the IV and anytime I got my blood drawn, like I almost felt nauseous, like going into those, I felt violated by them. Um, and so if you know that, especially your care providers, it, it's almost like having a conversation with your care provider and making sure that you have a team that's going to be supportive because we all, I mean, I know this now, but uh, cervical checks are kind of stupid. Um, <laughs> yeah, they like they don't tell you really yeah. anything because it's no. always different. Yeah, your cervix is not a crystal ball, and they're not really necessary. So the fact that they're really pushed on women and and almost in some situations forced on them, that can be terrible for a non-survivor. But if you add in the fact that you have a history of sexual assault, it makes it so much more violating. So knowing that ahead of time and finding the right care team, the right care provider that is going to limit those, you know, so they're aware of your experience and they're aware that, you know, we really need to limit these because it's, it's hindering you being able to progress in your, to let your body even progress in its labor and to give birth. So uh, that was one of the big things that I read and that I wish I had been able to have that conversation. And maybe I would have chosen completely different care providers, you know, or chosen to have a home birth. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, since I didn't have that knowledge at the time, I, you know, I was doing the best with what I knew. But but now if I had known that, I I, I would have found the right care provider that wouldn't have forced those on me because they felt, they felt very forced on me, even in the birth center. Like I thought a birth center, it was going to be less, but mm -hmm. it was still something they wanted to do, you know? So just kind of knowing that. And then just knowing, again, this book was more focused for the providers. Right. So a lot of it talked about signs to notice. So for me as a doula, like I know, now that I am a doula, one of my missions is to stay very trauma informed. And so when I'm when I'm with a client at her birth and I'm seeing certain behaviors play out and I, I know that they're linked to trauma reactions, then I can respond in different ways to her and support her in different ways. So the book talked a lot about that as far as how the care providers really, because the survivor it's not her job to do that. You know, it's, that's the support team's job. So I want to be really conscious as a doula and I hope that other care providers out there want to educate themselves more about trauma and how it can affect women uh, in this stage of life and know what signs to look for and um, know when it would be appropriate to respond differently and support her in a different way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that um, cervical checks in general are, like you said, not don't tell you that much and are very common practice, especially in the United States, but you can always refuse them. And I don't oh, think yes. people realize that. Um, and a midwife, yes. and I'm surprised about the birth center, like you said, but midwives that I've talked to are almost anti-cervical check because it gives women false hope or it lets them down and it's just like a mind game and yes. in the case of you with your water breaking it can cause an infection because you're inserting something into you know yes. into the body so I'm glad that we're talking about this in general and obviously I'm not giving any medical advice here but it's just something to talk about you know with your care provider and know that everything really in birth you have you have the option to make decisions and it's good to discuss those things ahead of time exactly and and I actually did the second time with uh, with my daughter, I refused them when I was pregnant. So mm -hmm. I didn't get a cervical check until I was in labor, but still they wanted to check me when I arrived at the birth center. And then since my water broke and I wasn't progressing, like, I guess that was why she wanted to check me again before I went to the hospital. I don't know, but I definitely would have done that differently had I known before. Yeah. yeah the ones during pregnancy are, are really 
interesting to me. <laughs> like, yeah, it's just it means nothing. And I with my first totally wanted to know because you're so anxious to meet the baby that you're like, oh, yeah, like, I want to know if I'm dilated. But when you're 37, 38, 39 weeks, like it, it doesn't mean anything, you know, so it's something we haven't really talked about that much on the podcast. But I have heard other people, you know, mention that at the hospital, you know, they get there and then just like some random nurse is. Yes sticking her fingers inside of you and it's just like it's not okay (laughs) you know like no No. matter who you are you need to be informed of what's happening and then make a decision you know for yourself yes definitely well is there any are there any other resources besides that one book that you found helpful either in your experiences or as a doula that you'd want to share just being a doula and just my own personal experience I think that any couple embarking on parenthood needs to take a childbirth ed class, um, and not the one provided by your hospital. (laughs) Yeah. So finding a really comprehensive childbirth education class that, um, so like I said, we did one that was 10 weeks long. So people hear that and they're like, Whoa, that's intense. But honestly, it probably wasn't even long enough because there was even more that we could have, you know, educated ourselves on, not even just if you want a natural birth, but just to be informed and just to know what is going to happen to your body and what types of interventions might be possible and what those would look like and why they may ha- might happen. Even if you're getting an epidural or you're going to have a C-section, like knowing what that's going to be like ahead of time can really help with all the emotions behind that, you know? because you're a little more prepared and know what to expect. Yeah, I love that. Especially like, like you said, you don't know what's going to happen. So having a comprehensive course that even if you're, you know, completely set on a natural birth, but for whatever reason, you end up with a cesarean, it's nice to know what those processes are, what things you can ask for and all of those things. And I do sometimes recommend not only finding an outside course, but if there's a short one at the hospital, taking that just to hear, you know, what their take is and what their policies are. And then, and then take the other course and then find out which things are required and which ones you can question and kind of be informed because a lot of the policies at hospitals, they're just their policies. And so people go in with their birth plan and the nurses are like, well, I'm putting an IV in you because that's our policy. And, Yes. It's frustrating for nurses too because they're the OB hasn't, you know, informed the patient that that's the policy, you know, so yes. there's a lot of different and, things to educate yourself on. Well, yeah, well and your OB could be saying one thing like, "Yeah, no problem. You don't have to have an IV. You can move around and have intermittent monitoring." And then the hospital is telling you something different and those don't align. Right. So educating your yourself might not be on call. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So educating yourself too on the place that you're giving birth cuz it might be different than what your care provider is telling you, for sure. Great. Well, I really appreciate, you know, you sharing your story and some of the kind of wisdom that you've gained. Is there any kind of final message that you'd like to leave with listeners? I became a doula just very much I was inspired by my journey with my births and it's it's very much aligned being a social worker I care a lot about feelings so <laughs> I'm I'm one of the, I you know I want people to talk about their feelings and get it out there you know that's what's healthy and that's what makes us better humans and so that's really my my overall goal career wise and what I want to do is kind of merge those two like doing doing this work within the birth world because it's such an intense emotional transformative experience. So, um, we need to talk about all the feelings that go with that because I think that's really playing into postpartum, um, and some of the experiences that women have postpartum because it's not necessarily always talked about like how you feel about your birth, you know, Mm -hmm. how you feel about what happened. And so, I think caring about that and validating that for women and and normalizing what they're feeling is really important and and we should all be doing that. Yeah, I agree. Well, can you tell listeners where they can connect with you online? It's new, but you can find me on Facebook. It's called Mindful Mama Collective. I'm hoping to open a very holistic, multidisciplinary practice for women in this stage of life that 
not only offers birth services, but also mental health services. And I'm also a blogger. So you can find my blog page. I'm on Instagram. It's at Mrs. Mom B. So you can also find me there and I'll likely be sharing on there as well as, uh, as my business starts to grow and get started. So thank you so much, Alexis, for taking the time today to share your story with us. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now we're going to talk to Sarah about her experience using baby list baby registry. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for coming on the birth hour today to talk about baby list. No problem. Can you tell us just a little bit about you and your family? Sure. So it's a very small family. It's me and my husband, and we have our first baby on the way. He's due May 12th. So it's just the three of us and our dog. Cool. And I met you through the Baby Moon Retreat, and I was talking to one of the other mamas there, and she was like, you have to talk to Sarah because she's obsessed with baby lists. So <laughs> I'm excited to hear. How did you find out about it? It was actually through that friend. So okay. she's a blogger and through kind of the, bro- the blogging world. I've never obviously had a baby registry, so I didn't know a whole lot about it. But that was something I had been told in previous conversations with friends that it kind of sucked to be tied to one store. So pick your stores carefully kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So when I found out about it, I was like, oh my gosh, because there's so much stuff I would like that's not in stores. So yeah. So how have you been using it so far to build your registry? First off, I mean, there's a lot of super cute stuff on Etsy, some stuff on eBay, just like land of nod places that people really couldn't go to in person and walk around and find stuff. So I just started throwing stuff on from those stores, just anything cute I saw. Um, And then Started talking to friends about their recommendations, pricing, just doing a bunch of like online reviews and finding multiple sources for certain like higher end products. So that's been like a huge help because people can look at more than one link to find a better price. Oh, that's really cool. And Babylist sends you like notifications when a price changes too, right? Right. And I've gotten three or four. I've had it set up for a couple of months and I've got three or four notices that the price has dropped a lot. So that's really, really good to know because then I can update it and super yeah. easy. And that'll be handy later on, like for stuff that you maybe didn't get as a gift. So you know mm-hmm. like when to buy it for yourself. Right. And we've been kind of using it as a Pinterest for ourselves almost because there's stuff that's like, you know, higher dollar that we're going to be buying for ourselves. And that's a really convenient place to keep it, especially because of the price change notifications and all that. So it's multitasking for us. <laughs> Do you mostly use it on the computer or have you used their app too? So I work in a computer all day, so I'm on it a lot on my desktop, but it's super convenient having it on the phone because me and my husband will sit down at the end of the day or in bed before bed and just scroll through stuff for ad, if like he sees something, he can add it on his phone. So um, kind of a little bit of both, honestly. I love that. So your husband has the app on his phone too? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Are you the type that likes to be surprised or are you like checking it all the time? I'm totally checking it all the time. <laughs> Just to see. Yeah, I think that's I most have, of us. <laughs> it's so fun. It's so fun. Like that first time someone bought one of the things off the registry, I was like, oh my gosh, people see it. Yeah. So it got me excited for the shower. Yeah. Making registries is probably the most fun. It's like a wish list <laughs> where you are going to totally. get most of the stuff. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. So what's the some of the things that you're most excited to get off your registry? One of the things I re- I've been looking at was one of the first things I saw when I found out I was having a boy was this mobile off of Etsy. And it's it's just perfect. So I've been looking all over, looking for this perfect mobile. For some reason, that was like very important to me. And I found one that's homemade. It's perfect colors. I look at it every day and <laughs> I don't know, I'm just in love with it. <laughs> and then it was just really easy to kind of pull cribs up and compare them and have them all on the list and sort of narrow down before I shared the baby list registry with everyone else. I was sort of using it to like, you know, drill down and narrow down our cribs. So that helped us pick a crib, a glider. There's all sorts of stuff, but a lot of the homemade stuff, like the toys and that, I don't know, that mobile is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, one of your friends is going to listen to this and they're going to know which, which gift you want the most. (laughs) I love the idea about comparing stuff too, because like with a registry in the store, you can't really just add five cribs to your registry. And then it's like not as easy to take them on and off. Right. And it gets super overwhelming with the price differences because there's some sites where, and there's also the problem with, um, I know we were looking at like a baby letto crib, which are um, parents ended up getting us, but there's this 
the ones that are super similar look almost exactly the same and are like $200 less. And you would never know that if you were just registering at, you know, a couple of different stores, you just sort of think you get what you get, Mm -hmm. but it sort of opens that up. And then again, with the price changing, something you really want that's maybe out of reach at first may not be like two weeks later. So it's been really good for price comparison. Awesome. And when's your baby shower? It's February 4th, so it's coming up here really oh, soon. Yeah. It's yeah. coming up so soon. <laughs> well, thanks so much for coming on and talking to us about baby lists, and hopefully you'll be back to share that birth story soon. Yeah, totally. I can't wait. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much again to Alexis and Sarah for coming on today's show and to Baby List for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget to head over to thebirthhour.com to find all of the links from today's episode, including that giant giveaway from Baby List, which I'm linking to at the bottom of the show notes page. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Birth Hour. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com to sign up for our newsletter. And if you really like the show, please subscribe and leave a review in iTunes. I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer, and you've been listening to another episode of The Birth Hour. Thanks again.